Thank you all very much. Um, welcome to the Building Back Better session. The first order of business is to call out um, the student leader who's going to be recognized for their commitment to action. So if I can call out Handel Meirezier from Haiti. So Handel and his colleagues um, started Hello Doctor in Haiti, and the health challenge they were addressing was that the health indicators in Haiti have been among the poorest in the world for generations. The 2010 earthquake demolished 50 health centers, a part of Haiti's primary teaching hospital, and the Ministry of Health. Subsequent cholera outbreak further strained the country's healthcare network, and Hurricane Matthew created a clean water and sanitation crisis in 2016. Hello Doctor is addressing uh, these problems in the following ways. Hello Doctor seeks to enhance patients' access to healthcare service through the use of a digital platform and a network of on-call doctors. Patients who cannot afford private hospitals are too sick to go to a hospital or doctor's office or who wish to be seen at home can connect to a doctor who will come to the house within one hour. Contact will be made through a website, smartphone app, or regular telephone call. And doctors who may be out of work continue to practice medicine, and patients have the comfort of being examined in their own homes. All doctors are required to be certified to practice by the Ministry of Public Health. The success of Hello Doctor will be evaluated uh, by the number of users, the number of doctors, and the number of services offered by network doctors. It's really cool, I just saw the beta app, it's like Uber that connects you with a doctor, not just a driver. And so for that, um, Handel is gonna receive this wonderful commitment to action form, and we're gonna take a picture, they're gonna Photoshop my head and put Bill Clinton's in, Handel, so <laughs> don't you worry about it, so. <laughs> All right, thank you. Well, um, Thank you, and I think let's bring out our, our uh, distinguished group of panelists. We have Dr. Catherine Adams, uh, come on out. Amira Ode, uh, come on out. Ambassador Liz Thompson, come on out. And Stefan Schaefer. Um, and we will sit down and get right into this um, huge, current, um, never-ending topic of disasters and how to build back better. So, welcome. If we could, um, just as we get going, try to go down the list, I think some of you can look up on the app, the uh, impressive backgrounds of our panelists to talk about this topic. And we have, as you'll see, people who have uh, different lenses on this issue from um, private, um, which began as a student-led involvement to working with youth um, from a private NGO perspective, from an international perspective, from the ambassador, from the city of Chicago's perspective in Stefan's case. And Liz is a uh, social service, privately run NGO in Haiti. So why don't we just go down, if you could just say a little bit about, we'll start with you, Dr. Liz, a brief introduction and what you do and where you do it. Okay, so uh, just to clarify, I'm Catherine Adams from Lide, uh, Haiti. We are an organization that provides psychosocial programs for adolescent girls, mostly in rural areas. But we started due to the crises in Haiti after 2010. Um, and so as a result of that, our work builds resiliency, focuses on girls' education and empowerment as well. But because of also being in crisis zones, we ended up doing a lot around teacher training um, and education and preparing educators and both in the informal and formal sector for uh, emergencies and the psychosocial needs that happen after that, which led to a lot of other work, cross-sectoral and working outside of education in helping people with the psychosocial side um, of trauma. So that's what we do. Great, thank you. <laughs> Amira. Thanks. Hi, my name is Amira. I am based and I am from Puerto Rico. And I am a community organizer. I've been a community organizer around environmental issues for about 10 years now. Um, but currently I'm focusing on reforestation and food security after Hurricane Maria since 
right after the day, after the hurricane, we started working on reforestation and making sure that people have access to food from their own backyards. So far, we have reached about 2,400 families giving out seeds and fruit trees um, to protect each other and to protect communities and to protect soil and watersheds. Great, thank you. Ambassador Liz. <laughs> I'm Liz Thompson. I'm from Barbados. I'm a lawyer by training. I'm a former minister of government. Uh, I. I'm a former Assistant Secretary General of the United Nations. I had co-responsibility for the Rio Plus 20 Conference on Sustainable Development. And I'm currently Barbados's ambassador to the United Nations. So, and I've worked as a consultant. So my areas have been energy, environment, and sustainable development. I'm a policy specialist, national and international, with particular emphasis on small island developing states. Great, thank you. Stefan. Hi, everyone. My name is Stefan Schaefer. I work in the Chicago Mayor's Office uh, here in the city locally. I served, um, I've been there for about four years now and have served as a policy aide uh, within his team. Um, so working on different policy issues that affect the city um, and more recently have um, started working on the city's resilience strategy, which actually seeks to address a broad range of issues, um, ranging from climate, social issues, issues of equity, uh, the economy um, that affect residents here locally um, and across the, y the swath of the city that it is, you know, greater than 230 square miles, um, making sure that residents in all parts of the city um, have an access, have an opportunity to access and participate in Chicago's future. Great. Well, thank you. I think over the past year we've had um, the largest ever fill in the blank hurricanes, um, hurricanes again, uh, with Hurricane Harvey, Hurricane Maria, um, uh, interspersed by. 100 year largest earthquakes in 100 years in Mexico that kind of uh, unfortunately got overlooked because some of the uh, media attention. Um, and then it's sort of kept going right through. There's been major events in Indonesia recently with yeah. liquefaction and tsunamis and earthquakes, which are endemic to that part of the world. And so I think part of it, and you've seen the different backgrounds here, is Disasters mean different things to different people, and the, the roles that different groups play, and particularly for you here at CGIU, I think we're going to ask the panelists to really talk about what they've learned in responding, I think, um, or preventing, anticipating the kinds of situations that unfold, because whether we like it or not, these things seem to be happening at um, more frequently, at larger scale, with more intensity. And as the population of the world has migrated to the coasts, um, I think the, the challenges for our species are undeniable. So I think you've seen, and I would ask each of you to reflect, not to put the pressure on you, but you're speaking on behalf of all local government officials, Stefan, um, <laughs> with all of the ambassadors, great background. She's speaking for all governments in the world. Um, so to give you a perspective of how um, people with her distinguished background would think and how you could engage with people at these different levels. And with Amira, I think coming from a community activist, these things always end up, um, there's, they're unique to their own circumstances, but they do follow a similar pattern and they're always handled to a large extent by people in the local communities that are affected, which I think Amira's uh, role recognizes and she's working on. And Dr. Catherine, I think, has introduced the issue of, you know, you hear sectors a lot if you get into international development work. Each of you and all of us is a member of all sectors, right? <laughs> the education sector. I think it's the way we've organized work, which makes a lot of sense. But unfortunately, it doesn't make a lot of sense necessarily for the people for whom these things are organized. So. I think we will be able to solve all the world's problems in the next 40 minutes if the moderator shuts up and lets the panelists talk. But I was just trying to set up, I think, the scale, the issues, and the different roles that can be played, particularly as you're looking at what, what you might do and what people have picked up along the way. So, Stefan, can you talk about what disasters mean from your perspective in a major city that um, has a lot of pressure, as all cities do? how you even think about it, um, what you're trying to do differently than you were five or 10 years ago, and what challenges you see ahead that the students might be interested in. Absolutely, so I think when you think about 
disasters in the context of Chicago. Um, you don't necessarily think about hurricanes or rising sea levels. We're not a coastal city. Um, where we are, however, the third largest city um, in the United States, population of 2.7 million, right? We are fortunately insulated from a lot of the effects of climate change, don't deal with nearly as many extreme weather events here locally. Um, but we still have challenges that we face as a large urban city, as many cities do. And so when we think about disasters in the context, we, we tend to take a broader lens about what are, what are the underlying factors that contribute to residents' abilities to adequately respond to and recover from a disaster when it indeed strikes. And so the, those underlying issues, you know, while we may be addressing the effects of climate change, are rooted in so social elements, right? They're rooted in issues of the economy and actual access to employment and wealth building. They're rooted to issues of cohesion and actually knowing your neighbor and your residents and your community. They're rooted in issues of equity. We in Chicago have a long storied history of disparities across our different neighborhoods um, across the city. And, and that plays out in different ways in terms of how dollars flows, dollars flows to those communities, investments are made in those communities, and the actual lived experience of residents who live in those communities. And so we have to develop a resilient strategy for the city. We have to develop an approach to responding to disasters in the city that takes an all the, all of the above approach. I think by way of example, the 1995 heat wave uh, that was so devastating to Chicago locally, um, for those who don't have the context, this was a heat wave that affected and actually killed over 700 residents, uh, predominantly residents on the south side of Chicago. It was a heat wave that spanned over five days, um, extreme weather, right? And these, these, this was a, a, an experience that was felt disproportionately by people of color in the south side of Chicago. Um, people, in fact, the, the mortality rate overlaid near perfectly with the poverty rate within our city. Right, and so you think about what that means, right, and the disparities in terms of a city's ability to be able to rebound and recover from an event, you know, a, a, an immediate event like a heat wave, um, that's essential, right? And even within those communities, there are different responses. Um, the North and South Lawndale neighborhoods within Chicago, demographically, socioeconomically, very similar to one another. However, the mortality rate was drastically different. Folks in South Lawndale lived at six times the rate than their, their counterparts in North Lawndale. And so what are those factors that actually allowed for that? On its surface, probably should have been the same, right? But actually looking at this as this extreme event as an example of how can we ensure that these, first off, the macro disparities are taken care of, right? That those are addressed and we're making sure that we're making investments all across the city so that every resident can benefit. But then also learning from these micro level experience of communities that are very similar to one another, where outcomes were different, and actually leveraging that as we think about risk disaster recovery for the future. Great, thank you. I think uh, having said you're immune from um, climate change, you have Haiti, Puerto Rico, Barbados, and Santa Barbara, and we're freezing to death here. But anyway, we'll uh, <laughs> give you a pass on that. Um, uh, Ambassador Liz, to talk us, uh, to us about what you've learned at advocating and training and working at both the national and international level at the, at the the broadest stage that exists, how you approach the definition of disasters and how you try to to alter the behavior so we don't have to have another session 10 years from now of yet again building back better. I think you've probably seen these uh, repeat history repeat itself. So. What's That's here? only like six questions and there's just 28 minutes. Okay, so let, let me <laughs> give you an example because I, uh, that helps to give you some notion of scale. For those of you who know how Sandy, Hurricane Sandy devastated the East Coast of the United States, New York, uh, New Jersey, and so on. Sandy, although it had peculiar circumstances, was a category three hurricane. Hurricane Irma and Maria that hit the Caribbean was a Category 5. You can't prepare for a Category 5 hurricane because everything is flattened. Um, every tree, and I want you to try to visually imagine it, that you come out of a structure if your structure survives and there is nothing standing around you. Every building is gone. 
every tree is either uprooted or the bark and the leaves are gone. And that means that your food crops are gone. You can't grow, the, the, the ground is saturated. You can't grow your crops. It means that your pet is probably gone. It means you have no transportation. It means there's been no storage of food, of water, of critical supplies, of sanitary napkins, of um, pampers for babies. There is nothing. On the day before Hurricane Sandy hit, I was in Belize, and my husband said to me, come home. Sandy is going to hit New York directly. And I said, no, no, I want to go back to New York. So. Preparation is about information. It's about early warning systems, knowing that you're going to get hit. And it is being prepared for not having anything. And because I had come from the Caribbean, I know what a hurricane is like. So I rush out to the supermarket, and I get cans of food and dry goods and biscuits. And I'm getting batteries and uh, candles and battery-operated devices. And I'm watching all these Americans pack their, their trolleys, oh, you say carts in the US, <laughs> with frozen dinner and pizza and, and all of this stuff. And I'm thinking, <laughs> they are clueless. So part of preparation, <laughs> and, and there were, by the next day, there was no power. It didn't occur to them to go to the ATM before. I watched a woman stand in a pharmacy and cry. She had nothing to give her baby, no cash, and there's no power, so she can't. She has a card. It means nothing because she can't get any money out of the, of the ATM, and they're only taking cash at the pharmacy. Scale that up a thousandfold for what happens in the Caribbean, and, and we're running out of time, so I'm going to speak a little about how you prepare. So you prepare by giving people information on what they need to expect, physically what they have to do before the storm hits, during the storm, how they keep themselves safe, and how you reach out and remain safe after. Because what you see in post-disasters is a high level of violence constantly from stress, from people not having access to basic supplies, uh, a lot of looting, and so on. Um, then you start to talk about things like uh, your, your physical construction. Do you, uh, your infrastructure, sinking your utility services, sinking your wiring, uh, not having your grids and other uh, components of your water supply system exposed, not using electricity perhaps, and transitioning to green methods of, of doing these things, building uh, not in areas, or rather not building in areas that are going to be flood prone, um, using crops that are more uh, hardy, that will tend to survive, that will plant easily, that will grow quickly. So you have to start thinking not just about, uh, you have to start thinking about basic survival and planning for basic survival. So that's at the national level. And at the international level, it is really trying to persuade countries who think that uh, the leaders of, of which think that uh, climate change is a hoax by the Chinese, that climate change really is very real and that there are very serious consequences of it. It is trying to get businesses to transition, to take in steps that reflect their corporate social responsibility and cutting their carbon emissions and reducing our footprint. It is about changing national and international behaviors. And therefore, a lot of multilateral negotiations go on to get countries to agree that climate change is real and that they need at the policy level for businesses and for the private sector to affect change. Now, I'm, I'm going to stop talking because of, of the time. But there are many, many components to what you do to prepare 
at the international level and at the national level and how you build back better. It isn't just about physical reconstruction. It is about improving your structures and systems. How do you distribute aid? When aid comes in, for instance, how do you get it to everybody who needs, where there may be no bridges, where there may be no road infrastructure, where the communication systems are down and you can't even let people know that there is food at a central location to which they can come. So it's, it's a uh, multi-tiered, multifaceted, and very complex. And you nailed, I, I may have asked only six questions, but you answered at least seven very well. So thank you. If I could ask Amir, I think what, what both uh, Stefan um, and Ambassador Liz mentioned was, you know, prepared, preparedness requires um, receiving information. It also requires trusting information. And the same thing is true for responding after the fact. You've got to trust the people who are in positions to communicate, whether it's ultimately down to the individual, as you were talking about, Liz. That's what community organizers do, right? I mean, you build trust at the local level. There are techniques that you use, and you happen to be doing it for reforestation. But can you talk about, particularly for people who are closer to your peers than, my, than mine, how you got into this work and the, the importance of just being a trusted source of information because you're asking people to do something differently. And that's always hard for all of us, right? So how did you find success in doing that? Just charm and smarts or uh, are there techniques that you've picked up that you can share? It's not easy at all. I mean, especially where I'm from, being a colony of the US and you can never trust, you can trust the local government, you can trust the US government. Um, they even teach us in school, like, be wary, don't trust anyone. Um, we are taught that, like, we're less, we can't do things on our own. So when a community organizer comes in and says, yeah, we can do this, we can handle this, then people are like, no, it's not possible. Because we're told all the time that we're less, that we can't manage. Um, so it's not easy. It, it, it takes mostly time. Um, it takes for people to be able to, for example, grow their own food, to see how community gardens work, for example. I mean, um, before the hurricane, before Hurricane Maria, um, many community gardens, for example, they were just like the two local hippie kids who like to plant. <laughs> um, and. Uh, after the hurricane, the communities realized that the only food they were getting was from that garden that they that the hippie kids were working in. <laughs> um, so people started to gather seeds and, and come in and plant trees and make community dinners every night. Um, and that's where people got together and started to realize, like, yeah, we can do this. We're not less. We do have the power to survive. And so many people started to get together and um, install solar panels in a community school um, and teach about community re re resilience and uh, um, teach about natural disaster relief. Um, so community organizers have been slowly after the hurricane showing people that they can do things at that with support from donations from the community and with everyone putting in a little bit of work that they can manage. And many people are trying to rebuild, um, considering that they can trust the government, considering that it's been a year after the hurricane and there's still people finding containers full of um, pampers and bottled water and canned goods that were never distributed. Um, and people are angry, but I also feel empowered in some way to know that if they want to survive, they have to do it on their own. Well, I think that's great. I, you know, I think each of you has talked about um, kind of the challenges and the information being required and the analysis that's been done. But I think, um, Dr. Catherine, I think you're perspective is a, a, a little bit different that you're involved in things that are very hard to measure. I think the, the consequences of these catastrophic, uh, catastrophic events on someone's life, what it does to their 
sense of safety and well-being in future direction. So even if we got these other things right, people who go through uh, this type of trauma are left different. And that's what you said you have recognized as an issue because of your involvement. Can you talk a little bit about that? Because it seems to me that people who are um, at CGIU and have that passion and also have that ability to connect and recognize not just the issues, but also the person. And how can we think about that differently, not just building back the infrastructure and the social structure, but the human um, kind of interaction differently? Right. So it's interesting because um, CGI also has a response network that developed out of Hurricanes Maria and Irma. Um, they also were a big part of the response to the earthquake in Haiti, to Hurricane Matthew, through similar networks. And something that comes up always in those conversations is we need to deal with the psychosocial issues. We need to deal with what's going on in people's hearts and minds because they're not able to function. We're talking build back better, and they can't even stand back up. And that comes from a will within. And you know what we've talked about a lot of times in these conversations that we've had is that in a disaster, um, it does affect people unevenly, as Stefan pointed out. And in countries that we label least developed countries, LDCs, um, it is even more prominent, more visual. And when you have a disaster like Hurricane Matthew for Haiti, um, what we say is, you know, Matthew just blew the roof off of the problems that were already there. These already existed. The poverty created the vulnerability. The instability and lack of infrastructure from the government side led to responders not being able to respond. Roads being out, bridges gone, routes closed. You know, and these happen in the everyday lives. And the vulnerabilities that also affect your ability to respond and come back after a crisis, after a traumatic event, those also begin before in your own resiliency. We talk about community resilience. There's also an individual level of resilience. And it's based on three main points, your connection to others, your ability to adapt to change, which also is tied to, for those of you in the education field, creative mindsets, creative thinking, flexible thinking, um, and also to a sense of hope and purpose. And when you have a disaster, all of those get destroyed. The people you were connected to are now gone. You are all displaced. You are separated. And many of those people are dead. The things that were solid underneath your feet are gone. The route you thought you were going to take to the future is gone. For youth, it is not just people they grieve for. It is their future and their dreams. Their purpose and their hope is gone. That university building is flattened. Their family no longer have the money to send them to school. Their family no longer have money to eat. And so they have to stop going to school and find some work to keep their family eating. The girls that we work with, they start out their lives vulnerable. Okay, They already wake up at 4 AM in order to go an hour away to collect water, in order to bring it back and cook for their family, to get charbon, charcoal, to cook, because they don't have electricity. right? So they're building a fire and cooking in a giant kettle and cooking for 15 people, because that's a girl's duty. And then they might get to go to school. In one of the communities where we work that was greatly hit by the hurricane, that's a two-hour walk if you're in secondary school, because there are no secondary schools for them. In a country where there are only 14% of the schools public, 
publicly funded, and where even that means you pay for your own uniform, you pay your own exam fees, and you pay additional fees. So they start out vulnerable. And then you add a disaster on top of that, and the earth is shaken, literally and metaphorically. So you need to address the psychosocial issues. And while we began doing that in the education sector and with girls, what became clear was this needed to be in all sectors. And in fact, we even had NGOs turning to us saying, can you help our staff? Um, and so a lot of times that's what we were doing and we were going in and doing debriefs with response teams and relief workers and people caught up in these natural disasters so that they, you know, it, it, as you hear on the airplane, you have to put your oxygen mask on first and then the child's mask. If you're not breathing, you can't do any good. So we work with responders around that. And in fact, right now, um, so a couple of weeks ago, we had a 5.9 earthquake in the north of Haiti. And when you're talking people living in houses that are built out of cinder block with no rebar and no reinforcement, that's a very dangerous thing. It's nothing in California where I was born, you know. I'm like, get over it, man, you know. Duck and cover. They're not taught duck and cover. And duck under what, you know? So, and they're in buildings that crumble. And so we have, right now, we're partnering JPHRO, which I don't know if some of you have heard of. Um, they work in Haiti, primarily. They're also helping with uh, Hurricane Florence and uh, uh, Michael recovery. But we have a uh, psychologist embedded with their engineers. Why? because those engineers are going door to door to the families whose houses are destroyed, and they don't know how to handle the emotions that greet them at that door, right? So that's one of the ways that we work on resiliency, and we also work across sector in, the, in that response. Right? Thank you. I, I, Way off on a tangent. I appreciate that. Um, I think the it raises kind of the issue of understanding uh, disasters and what to do to either prevent them or build back better after them from a number of different dimensions. There's a physical infrastructure, um, but as many of you have now said, there's a social infrastructure that is kind of understandable for those of you social scientists. I mean, there's a concept of social vulnerability, and people ask us, um, who's the most vulnerable person in an emergency? And the, the answer is really easy, the people who are the most vulnerable the day before. And so if you understand who they are and where they are, yeah. and it really relates to poverty, um, they, people who are poor die younger, stay sicker longer um, from things that are preventable. And these are the types of things, I think you've all said it in a slightly different way, that these big disasters cause problems, but they also expose problems and um, that were already there but maybe ignored. So the, the question is, um, as you go forward, working in government, uh, working privately, and it's a private NGO, who should build what back better, how? I mean, so we all have different roles, and I think those of you, may, many of you may be thinking of going to private enterprise or private business or government service, and I think the rules are, you know, the roles are being redefined. Who should do what um, going forward? And um, Stephanie, you want to maybe talk about how you see, as a government official, the importance of non-government people being involved yeah. to build back better. Absolutely. So, I, I, and I heard, you know, some of these themes I already alluded to from Liz in, in the form of, you know, what role does government play? How can government lead, right? But also, how can community organizing, community-based organizations actually spearhead a lot of these efforts? So, I do think there is a role, in spite of our federal leadership currently within this country, which I'll, I'll say it, I'm not. The biggest fan, um, but you know there is there is a, a, not necessarily the most popular opinion, but I'll put it out there. So um, you know there is a role for local government, I would say, and we're seeing more and more leaders of major cities across the country step up to carry that torch, um, and that takes the you know they, that takes the tone of 
actually remaining committed to many of the commitments that we've made in the past. Um, in Chicago, we committed to a Chicago charter, uh, climate charter, which actually is a coalition of over 68 cities who have uh, actually said they're going to follow through on the commitments they made as part of the Paris Agreement in terms of their reductions of, of greenhouse gases by 2025. So I think local government can lead in many respects. It has the authority and folks are elected to lead in those roles. But again, at the end of the day, we also recognize not every answer starts and ends with the government. We have to actually build that sort of trust and actually lo look to local community-based organizations to carry that mantle for us. And so part of that is just recognizing that there's a lot of work already being done by neighborhood groups. In Chicago, we, I think of the Southwest Organizing Project. Uh, there's the Resident Association of Greater Englewood. There are neighborhood groups that actually bring together residents um, who are just invested in seeing community change and actually affecting that change themselves. And that might span, span a, a range of issues. It might just be about housing, housing affordability and being able to stay in their homes, right? It might actually be about youth em empowerment, um, civic engagement, actually getting the youth involved um, within their neighborhoods. And that's something the city of Chicago could never do. That's something local government could never do because we will never understand these communities as well as the residents who live in them. Um, so I'll pause there. Well, I think it's the same question for, I mean, you, you, there's no higher job unless it's the, I guess, the leader of the world than you've had almost. So you're working at a very high level of intergovernmental the UN, but you are also pretty um, passionate about the involvement of the individual person. So I think the question is, how do you make sure that the perspective from, whether it's a student group or community group, gets listened to? I mean, you clearly have, but I mean, are there examples that you can remember that have informed your view in any of your jobs that have stuck with you as you've ascended to these higher positions? Because I think people starting out need to know, if I'm going to put this time in, it's got to count and um, it should stick somewhere. Any perspective on that? I think that um, we don't necessarily value highly grassroots information and knowledge, and that often in communities, that's what saves a lot of people. It is the traditional knowledge, it is that grassroots information and grassroots organization. So I'd say that governments need to draw on that in addition to getting to understand what are international best practices, what have worked at national levels and what have not worked and why, and regulation. I know Americans um, don't like the notion of government regulation, but it is critical. Things like planning rules and building rules and building standards. Regulation is critical to saving lives and helping communities help themselves prepare and resist and, and be resilient in relation to, um, to hurricanes. And I would say then translating all of that information at the international level so that there is greater sensitization and an international conversation about the responsibility of countries to cut their carbon emissions because it isn't just about profitability, it isn't about sustainability, it really is about basic survival for a lot of people across the globe. I appreciate that. Well, Amira, the same thing, I think you have, um as a, as a young person starting your first environmental recycling project, you developed the skill to navigate up. So what you were learning and were passionate about was you were able to figure out how to make sure that the, those in other positions of influence heard it. Otherwise, you wouldn't be sitting on this august panel. So how did you do that? I mean, is this something you were um, doing thoughtfully? Did it happen by accident? What, what advice can you give to your peers here, if I care about this issue and I want to work locally, how do I make sure what I learn gets elevated? You've done that. I mean, all the things that I've done, basically, it's all been by accident. Um, and I realized that in every step, if I cared about something, I could never find anyone that wanted to work on that. So I was like, OK, I can sleep at night knowing that this problem is happening, so I guess I have to do it. I'm also kind of a workaholic, so I don't recommend that. <laughs> um, but yeah, it's just building good circles and building good connections with people. And I also believe a lot in training people. If you're good at something, 
you train other people to keep working on that. I started working on a plastic reduction program when I was a student at the University of Puerto Rico. Um, and when I left, I trained people to handle that program, and I left to continue to do other things. You can't just like take ownership of, of something and then leave, because there are people and communities depending on that thing that you're working on. You can just move on, but always be mindful of leaving someone empowered to handle the work. If I can ask as a follow-up, I mean, that. You know, training. There's training and there's training, right? You can go. Through, we've all been through training classes that are like, oh my, you know, like driver's ed. You know, it's like <laughs> the most boring training sometimes. But you know, there's identifying people with that spark, who are going to take the training and push it forward, not just learn the rules. How, what do you look for when you're trying to train someone or engage someone in, in the things that you care about, um, so you can confidently leave behind said, it's not just the book with the rules to follow, there's something else that, that spark. Is that something that you look for? Don't yeah. say it's just by accident again. That was uh, <laughs> No, not this time. Yeah, okay. <laughs> you have to be a good observer, because hmm. commitment doesn't show the same in every person. There are some people that if you are a group leader, they show up to every single meeting, and they're always there, and they speak at everything, and they want to do everything. And there's also the shy people who sit in the back that don't want to talk to anyone, but you notice that they show up. And even if they don't talk, and if they stay in the dark corner in the back, they're there. And that's where you gather them in, and you first talk to them. Do you want a training on how to plan an event? Do you want a training on how to fundraise? Um, I've been um, training people um, at events where, for example, we're talking about plastic reduction, and they say, oh, that, I, that's not my thing. I like clean energy. So I'm like, OK, we're not working on that. But like, here's 50 bucks from our organization. Do what you want to start. Plan your first event. Um, like After that 50 bucks, you get 500 from what we fundraise. You do your thing. And making them feel that they're trusted makes them feel empowered. And they go from working on a thing that maybe is not your area of focus. Um, but then since they start with one thing, then they feel empowered and go then to your area of focus. So it's all about studying every person individually and realizing that talents come in all forms. Appreciate that. Catherine, so we have about 51 seconds left. So. Um, <laughs> What's the meaning of life, and what can you share with? Um, uh, no, I mean, I, I, I'm trying to get it. I think you've all brought it out. There's passion, there's intellectual knowledge and understanding these issues, but there's also a, the importance of personal leadership and engagement. So maybe you could, we could just go down the list and say, uh, briefly, do you remember the thing that set you on this path? Um, oh, that's not brief. Um. Well, okay, well, <laughs> say it briefly because now there's only 22 seconds. Okay, um, I'll try. Um, so here's the thing that I hope you all will someday discover, is that you will never take a wrong path ever in your life. All the paths that you step onto are going to converge. There will be a time and a place where everything you have ever learned has to come together. Before I did this, I was a professor. I was a tenured professor, for goodness sakes. Yeah. Um, before I did that, I was a psychotherapist. Before I did that, I was a writer. Before I did that, I was a professional classical ballet dancer. Before I did that, I was oh, a come on, come on. Now, rebellious that, 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 teenager. <laughs> this is the most important part of it. <laughs> okay. Most important part of it, I was a rebellious teenager <laughs> whose first vehicle was a four-wheel drive off-road vehicle. OK. So flash forward to the Haiti context, where I work with girls, where, more importantly, I train the very qualified people around them to work with those girls. And I train those girls to be mentors to each other, where I have had to 
repair a four-wheel drive vehicle off-road in the middle of a road that leads to the middle of nowhere in Haiti when it broke down, while the two male passengers in the car finished their conversation. Thank you. <laughs> yes. You know, and all of these things, I never thought they would come together. I thought, God. How is it that I go from being this to being that? I've spent 13 years in higher education. Oh, my God. You know? And it all came together when I had to understand how to use the arts to help a girl tap into her soul, to help a girl find her voice, and to get in that truck and get back on the road. <laughs> right? So it all comes together. And well, I also learned from that that we all have to work together, you know. Too often, us NGOs and others, multi-sector, multilateral, meet with each other on these panels. When, when we're working on the ground, we're in our own silo, right? So we need to find ways to communicate and to work across sector because, as you said at the very start, we're all whole people. We're not just one thing. I'm not just a learner. I'm not just an IT person. I'm not just, right? We're whole people. And we have to address the whole issue by working together. Um, and I think that that's going to be our best way forward. So as you're working on your own commitments to action, my advice on that is look for what are the things that make you angry or sad in this world and that you feel like you must change or die. Take everything you have learned and everything you're capable of learning in the future and put it into that work. And then also realize that that work's going to evolve and change. And you may end up, like me someday, <laughs> talking to uh, Dr. Liz's crowd on the floor of the UN instead of driving that truck, which I had to do. I had to be helicopter airlifted out of Haiti in order to do that at the high level political forum, but that's a whole other story. <laughs> anyway. Thank you. Um, well, we, I think we want to leave some time um, for questions from the audience. Um, and I said I will do that on one hand, that someone else gets to pick the questioner, and that would be. Um, these skilled people who materialize from CGIU, Carrie. Um, so thank you all. We, I, I'm sensitive. I wanted to get that, but um, we'll. Hi, my name is Nancy. I'm from New Zealand, so Asia Pacific. It's one of the most disaster-prone regions of the world. And when you mentioned breaking down silos, I was just thinking about. Uh, you know, across sectors as well. Is there, do you see more movement in terms of when you're building back after disaster to also do more with disaster risk reduction because we can see increased, you know, increased, uh, you know, d displacement because of climate, you know, climate disasters, natural disasters, whole, you know, whole slew of things. So how can we also combine the humanitarian aid response with preventing and reducing risk in the future? Thank you. Can I direct okay, I that start? to Liz? Uh, no, I think. No, uh, no, go ahead. Oh, go ahead. Okay, I mean, was that Sorry. Any then, but or? I know Liz has an answer yeah. too, so we'll we'll, get, we'll it'll probably be very synergistic. Um, so what we are trying to get people to do now, especially in disaster response, is to think in terms of disaster resilience when they're making that response. So as you take those response actions. You need to be building plans that are about resilience and the future. That too often we think about the short term and we need to be focusing on the long term. I think that the conversation around resilience and rebuilding has really evolved a lot around um, breaking silos. For instance, a minister of tourism thinks about bringing more tourists into the country. He do, or she does not think about the water resources that he's going to need for those tourists. 
what is going to happen if tourists are trapped on island during a hurricane or, or disaster event. That is what the Minister of Environment thinks about. The Minister of Energy doesn't think of the interconnection between energy supply and water supply and water needed to pump energy and energy needed for water, etc. So that is why breaking down silos is so important. You have to get all of these people at the table, thinking together, utilizing um, financial resources so that they are resource efficient and effective in delivery, and really thinking about the, uh, pr the problem as a common whole. So yes, at the international level, we're also recognizing the importance of um, not having a siloed approach, but the reality is that people are territorial. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Hello, Hi. Uh, my name is Colonist Morris. I'm from Chicago. Um, I was eight years old in 1995, and uh, I witnessed my great aunt that was one of the 700 people that died during the great the heat wave that happened in Chicago. And I remember a week prior, we were screaming to her to put an air conditioner in the house, and she said, oh, it's never going to happen to me. I'm healthy. I love the heat. Now fast forward to today in which every time a crisis happened, we kind of noticed that, particularly in our society, we have this very large disconnect that we don't respond to crises until it happens to us. Yeah. We've seen it during the World Trade Center bombing. We saw it with the shootings in uh, elementary and high schools. There's always this sense of, well, it's not happening to us. We don't have to worry about it. So all of us there in, the, in this room, we're trying to bring awareness to our constituents, to our fellow mm -hmm. Americans, whoever, that a crisis can be around the corner, but yet we're still dealing with a society aspect of, well, it's not going to happen to us. How can we combat that? What tools can we use to help push the narrative of don't it's not going to happen to us, or to it can happen to us, and we can prepare for it. Stefan, can I sure. um, turn that to you? Thank you for that yeah. excellent set of remarks and question. Yeah, thank you for sharing that. And to your question, I think you know first and foremost, um, there's an acknowledgement, which I think you just did really eloquently right there in terms of our past as a city, right? But I think for cities and countries and regions more generally understanding what has happened before um, as a mechanism to help combat repeating those same mistakes in the future, right? So in the context of Chicago, knowing and understanding the impacts of that heat wave, right, on our city's residents and how that's still playing out and persisting in many different forms today. You know, I, I don't want to speculate, right, about your aunt's ability not to purchase that or install that air conditioner. She did purchase it. She just got it. Exactly. Exactly. I think telling those stories, first and foremost, right? I think your experience within your family, being able to share your lived experience, your aunt's experience, right, and the response that your family ultimately had, that's the type of connectedness, uh, which is a theme I think we've like all spoken of here, that building a truly resilient community requires, right? And that means a vulnerability, that means an honesty about the things that we see and have experienced in the past, but also the, the needs that we have going forward, right? So sharing stories about the importance and emphasizing exactly why, you know, community preparedness 
actually disaster preparedness more broadly, right, is essential. Um, and that can be on a personal level, right? Connecting it to your individual self makes it more real, right? I, me as government, I can only tell you so much, right? I can tell you to weatherize your homes, right? I can, I can send departments and agency staff to educate you. But you as a neighbor, as a member of your household, have a story that is by far going to be more compelling than anything I could possibly ever say. So I think that's what I would point to first, is looking to residents, looking to those around you to be able to share and, to share and kind of expand on those stories. And if I could just say, I mean, so many of the speakers, including at the last plenary, I mean, that um, they were working in different fields, but they were all, I guess, for lack of a better term, social influencers. I mean, they probably they didn't describe themselves that way, but it's in the inclusiveness for people with disabilities and valuing the contributions or understanding people who are coming from the experience of an LBGTQ background. You're all that. You may not think of yourself, I, I want to be a social influencer. You want to get something done. But I think to your point, we've had so much evidence of the speakers who, by virtue of their passion, become social influencers for exactly what Stefan just said. Because you care, it's real, and people don't trust much anymore. They tend to trust people they know. Now, your friend in Brooklyn, I don't know what to do about that. I'm going to get you know, that's, that's a guy probably, right? So OK, that's, yeah, sorry. I got nothing. Um, but I think the, the notion of understanding, because you're seeing, you're surrounded by people who are clearly influential within their circles as well as switched on and committed, and understanding how that can be um, kind of used to advance these issues, I think, is really important. So it's not just reaction to crisis. Um, it's people have got something that's been communicated in a way that they understand by someone they trust. And I have this sneaking suspicion you'd be really good at it. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Uh, I am just curious about, uh, specifically directed to Amira and, uh, and the ambassador, uh, how policy uh, actually can impact uh, disaster response. Uh, and I'm thinking about the US-Cuba relations, where we don't even have, we have barely any relations, right? Uh, the policies that prohibit us from getting aid to Puerto Rico quicker because we ha they had to get certain supplies from certain, you know, those kind of things. So how have you experienced that? And what can we do to overcome that element within da disaster response? If you live in the US, call your Congress people and tell them to destroy the Jones Act. That stopped a lot of aid from getting to us. Many countries sent aid to Puerto Rico. And in the San Juan port, the ships were returned back home because they wouldn't allow them to enter while people were dying. And they were hungry, and they were thirsty, and they were in hospitals without any medicine. Um, and that's just plain cruel. I think policy for US colonies is just evil. For the sake of time, I'm simply going to say ditto. Next question. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> thank God. <laughs> <Sorry>. <laughs> OK, hello. Um, thank you. Again, my name is Abigail Franks, and I am studying political science with a minor in peace, justice, and ecology. Oh. I don't, it's a lot. Um, <laughs> Interesting. Thank you. Um, I am so passionate about so many things when it comes to the environment and when it comes to human rights. I don't even know where to start. And I'm, I want to get, I want to help as much as possible, but I don't know if I should narrow down my interest or if I should go for you know global international aid or if I should start a grassroots nonprofit level I don't I don't even know where to start so do you have any advice of what I should do or anyone else that is in a similar position as I am so thank you I think believe that you have value believe that you have something to offer irrespective of your flaws or gaps in your knowledge and just pursue something that you feel passionate about. I've found, and Catherine said it earlier, that your path opens up. Yeah. 
Sometimes you have to make a choice or a decision, but your path opens up. And if you do what you are passionate about, if you pursue the things that you love, you're really going to be happy. And that is going to connect you to something else or someone else. And that is how, that's, that's how life happens. So just pursue your interests and believe that the right opportunity is going to come along. Look for it and, and believe that you have something to offer. And I want to say that to all of you. You have value. You can bring value. Don't sit on the sidelines. Make a decision to, to, to make a difference in, in somebody else's life, not just in your own life, but in somebody else's life. And just pursue your passion. <laughs> Hello, I'm Harris Bostick, and I'm with the Tides Foundation in San Francisco. And I have many foundations and funds that want to um, support disasters. Right. They hear about the Indonesian earthquake. They hear about uh, Hurricane Florence and Michael, and they want to send money. After the cameras go away, they don't hear it anymore. Hmm. You know, if I say something about Hurricane Florence, they say, well, that's over. So what, what concrete ways to keep them engaged and knowledgeable about the long term? We're talking about years and years and years, and that's my struggle. Because they have the means and the resources, it's just that they're kind of, I guess, myo myopic about it. Thank you. Okay. So in the NGO world, and you know, Thomas knows this firsthand too, this is a huge struggle for us. Because as we mentioned earlier, these problems aren't just disaster related. Indeed, they're not disaster related at all. If the other underlying issues had been dealt with, there would have been greater resiliency to these problems. So in terms of donors, um, you know, all I can say is I, I keep hoping <laughs> that what we can get them to see is that, is the underlying issues, and that that is a long-term process. And that to the question earlier of looking long-term and not short-term and building resiliency long-term, those kind of responses to a disaster take time, but they have a better effect. If you go in, for example, Okay, so out in Haiti in the middle of, it's called Terdenig. I didn't give it that name. It's way out past Lens Rouge in the northwest, in the red zone of hunger and insecurity. And after the floods back in like 2000, early 2000s in the north of Haiti, someone went out and built a well. And they did the short term response. We're gonna come in and build a well. They built a well. Well, all the parts broke within months because those parts were imported and not meant for that terrain or that country. And no one bothered to teach the community how to repair the well, take care of the well, or build the well themselves again. So that well sits there broken while my students, my participants in, in the day walk you know, 30 minutes to an hour down a cliff in order to bring up water that is so contaminated with groundwater that it's yellow. And that's what they bathe in, drink, wash with. That's, and, and that's a ripple effect on health, okay? So with the Build Back Better idea, you go in and you use resources that are available in that country and you teach, if, if it is a skill that isn't present among the community that you're serving, you teach the community that skill. Um, there's many organizations that take on this model now. We take on this model. You know, All our staff are Haitian. And, and when we brought expertise in, it was with the idea of we're going to accompany you in taking this on yourself, in making this yours, because you know the community. And you're staying. I'm not. Right? You stay. So if we could get donors to realize that and to realize that their investment is wasted on those short-term solutions. And I know we're running a little bit over, but I really wish Tom would comment on the, the generator to 
solar energy story that you were telling backstage? Oh, me? Yeah. Oh, uh, <laughs> well, yeah, I, um, no, because there's no time, but um, it was, um, if President Clinton has a suggestion, it's a really, usually a really good one, and it, you should probably just follow his lead, because I think he uh, had direct relief end up um, becoming deeply engaged in solarizing all the health centers in Puerto Rico, which we did not intend to do, but the logic was inescapable, and that's what the people wanted. So I think in, in answer to your question here, I think the, the easy three-point test for me is um, look for people who are serving those who are most vulnerable yeah. and who are going to be there five years from now, yeah, right. and, that you tr and that the community trusts, and they have the most at stake, they have the highest vested interest in how the money is going to be spent, they have good ideas, whether it's local knowledge or cultural traditions, and I think Direct Relief is a support organization, and we have certainly found that, um, you know, if you find a good partner, it's like in life. Uh, it's hard to do, but things sure line up once you do. So, um, but I think the longevity, uh, the respect, and they'll be there in five years is a pretty good marker, and that's what we use. I'm sensitive to the time. Is this, I've gotten the nod from the big boss. Um, thank you all so much to our panelists and to each of you for coming. And, um, Way to go. Keep going and go to the plenary session. And thank you all. And thank you, Handel, for um, winning that award.